booktube. My name is Elizabeth and I read bouquins and books. I filmed my latest weekly wrap up yesterday and since then I have read two books. No, I have not turned into Steve Donahue. I just read very, very short books. <laughs> they are in fact the short stories that have been printed into book formats uh, for well, for, for, for good reason, because I bought them, probably in Pulse Buy near the cash register. Um, they're not new, the price is written in francs, and it's been a while since France has used the franc. So um, I've had them for 25 years, and I know I read them at the time, and I had not read them since. And I couldn't really remember what they were about, so I decided to read them again. And... Um, yeah, this one is a little short story by Tolstoy. I forgot to check what the title was in English. I believe it is, uh, if we translate it word for word, it is, this is how love dies. Uh, but uh, regardless, I will check it uh, before I post the video and I will write the correct title in the description box below. And this one is by Guy de Maupassant. It is uh, the Rondoy sisters. And I really remember nothing of that one. The other one I sort of remembered. As soon as I started reading, I remembered, oh yes, I, I know how it ends. But this one, I couldn't remember anything. And um, I liked it. I, I quite liked it, even though it's a very pessimistic and it's very um, somewhat sexist. This is symbolic, you know. It, it, it represents something else, a body part, a woman's body part. <laughs> and anyway, um, the narrator in this book, in this, yes, this book, it's a book. Uh, the narrator in this short story is uh, quite a pessimist. And I wanted to read a passage to you. So I found an English translation online. And uh, this is the little paragraph by the very uh, happy um, uh, narrator. He's about to go to Italy. He's um, at, the, at the moment, is he on the train? I think he is on the train and thinking about what's waiting for him at the hotel. I cannot lift up the sheets of a hotel bed without a shiver of disgust. What took place there the night before? What dirty, odious people have slept in it? I began then to think of all the horrible people with whom one rubs shoulders every day. Hideous hunchbacks, people with flabby bodies, with dirty hands that make you wonder what their feet and the rest of their bodies are like. I think of those who exhale a smell of garlic and dirt that is loathsome. I think of the deformed and purulent, of the perspiration emanating from the sick, of everything that is ugly in men. And all this, perhaps, in the bed in which I am going to sleep. <laughs> so if there are travelers among you who think the pandemic have the, has deprived them of something uh, wonderful, well, perhaps this will... Uh, cheer you up. You have avoided disgusting, ugly hotel beds. <laughs> so uh, this, uh, well, this is what I read this morning. And this afternoon, I went to book shopping to a second-hand bookstore. I don't do that very often. I tend to prefer new books, but I love to discover new bookstores. And I went to um, uh, the other side of the river. I went on the Quebec side, so I found mainly books in French. So um, the first book that I found was uh, Balzac, uh, the Cousin, cousin Ponce. Uh, I think that's the title in English. Once again, I'll make sure to write the correct title in English in the description box below. I started reading Balzac only last year. Um, well, I read one in college that was mandatory reading, uh, Father Goriot, that I did not like at the time. Uh, normally, I really liked the, um, the books they made us read, but for that time, I didn't understand it, I didn't like it. But last year I read Eugénie Grandet, and then I read Colonel Chabert, and then I read An Old Maid, and I really like Balzac, so I'm going to keep discovering Balzac. So there was this book, the original price tag is still there. So the original buyer bought it for $9.95, but uh, I bought it for $3. Yeah, it's written there. And um, yeah, th three Canadian dollars, I should say. So that's uh, less than $2.50 US. So it's really a good deal. And the other thing that I found that is just totally lovely is this box set of gorgeous little books. Um, 
There are five books. They are all written by uh, French authors of the 19th century, and they all feature women as main characters. And now three of them I've already read. Uh, this one is Balzac, uh, Eugénie Grandet, that I read last year, which was in fact my entry into Balzac, and I quite liked it. So there's this one. Uh, this one is one of my favorite books of all time. This is The Lady's Paradise by Zola. And uh, I wanted to buy a new copy because mine was starting to be a bit old. So this is my new copy. And then this is Colomba by Prosper Mérimée. Uh, this one is set in Corsica. And um, yeah, it's quite interesting. It's a, a very folk atmosphere. It's not folk. Le legendary, not legendary. What do I mean? Very typical Corsican village and Corsican, um, um, well, a bit stereotype, I guess. But anyway, it has a very strong Corsican feel to it, and it was very nice. And these two I haven't read yet, so I have no idea what they are about. This is by Théophile Gauthier, and this is Miss de Maupin, I guess, the title in English. And this one is Manon Lescaut by Abbé Prévost. Uh, Abbe means abbot, so written by a priest. I don't know how this will be. So uh, I've heard the titles of these books. I know these authors, though I've never read them. Um, so I don't really know what to expect. So the, these will be new adventures. And the books are really, really nice um, with the golden uh, edges and the beautiful wallpaper. And oh, well, the inside paper is not bad. Um, however, inside there's no introduction, no uh, explanations, no analysis, it's just the plain text. But uh, that's fine with me, I can always find other explanations on the internet if I want to. So that is what I found in French. And I also found one book in English. Um, not very long ago, uh, two of my booktube friends, David Wiley and Shelley Swearingen, started the Eclectic Book Club. And uh, the first book they read was uh, for the month of November. It was Fahrenheit 451 by Ray Bradbury. And recently they announced what would be coming up. Uh, and in December, it's going to be The Iliad by Homer. Now, when I saw that, I thought, okay, it's finally the time for me to read The Iliad. But at the same time, I thought, oh, I don't want to read The Iliad. Anyway, I don't have the book. Okay, I don't have the book. I won't have to join. And uh, I found the book <laughs> for three Canadian dollars once again in almost... Well, in pristine condition, it's almost new. There's nothing written in it. There's, um, yeah, maybe it's never been read. I think, no, there are a couple of pages that are folded in the corner, but that's it. So, um, like new. So I'm going to have to read the Iliad in December. So, uh, that is it. That is it for my haul. And that is all I had to say for today. So I think I'm going to turn this into a vlog, perhaps, maybe. I'll see. If I have absolutely nothing else to say in the coming days, I'll just post this video as is. So in case I post this video as is, thank you for watching. I will see you in the next video. And if I don't post it as is, I will see you in half a second. <laughs> Hello, it's Elizabeth from a few minutes later. I started reading one of my cute little books. I started with Manon Lescaut and I realized I said something stupid. I said all the books in the box set were from the 18th century. Now I said they were from the 19th century and it turns out this one is from the 18th century. It was published in 1731 and apparently has never been out of print since. Um, I've read the... Um, the equivalent of the, the, the summary a bit there. I haven't read it all because I'm pretty sure it's full of spoilers, uh, but I expect some sort of morality tale. I'll let you know. We are Tuesday evening and apparently it's time for an update. I am still reading Manon Lescaut. I'm having a lot of fun reading that book. I like the book itself. I like the format. I like the pages. I like holding that teeny tiny book in my hands. I like it. Um, I'm about two-thirds of the way in, so I also like the content. Uh, now, I read I read completely the blurbs at the beginning in, um, on both flaps, and I've learned that this book is part of a much bigger work. It is volume seven of uh, a massive work, uh, massive work called Memoirs and Adventures of a Man of Quality. However, it is not really related to the rest of the book. The only relation to the rest of the book is... The, the sort of prologue uh, to link the story of the young men in this book to the story of the men of quality. So basically, the men of quality is traveling for business and among um, uh, during his travels, he 
runs into a convoy of prisoners, of women prisoners who are about to be shipped off to the Americas uh, because these women are fallen women, they are prostitutes basically. So uh, among these women, one of them catches his eye and uh, she's a bit younger than the others, she's prettier, she is uh, apparently a bit more distinguished, like she's a bit more from an upper class than the other women. And of course, the man of quality is intrigued by this woman and asks uh, the officer in charge, uh, who is she? What's her story? What is she doing there? And the officer answers, I don't know, ask the young man who is following her. So that is basically how the man of quality meets the young man. And uh, a few pages later, a few pages later, it is the young man who tells his story. So the entire book is narrated by the young man. And the main character is really the young man. It is not Manon Lescaut. She, she ends up being a secondary character because, because the story is told by the young man from his perspective. And the way he views Manon, because he's so in love with her, um, he views her not as she is. So that's another way in which she's not a main character at all. She's a secondary character because we see her only through someone else's eyes. Uh, we don't see the real Manon. We just see the version of Manon that uh, the narrator wants to see. Um, even though he was uh, duped quite a few times. So uh, as I suspected, this is going to be a, mor a morality tale because, well, I just said so. It opens like this. Manon is about to be shipped off to the Americas as a prostitute. Um, so uh, it is obviously a morality tale, but I wonder um, what will happen to the young man, because uh, when we meet him at the beginning, he's not being shipped off to the Americas. He's free. So I wonder what if the, the moral compass of the young man will somehow be um, set straight again, or if it will remain what it is becoming as I read. Um, because it's a, basically a story of corruption. Uh, this young man who was all innocent and pure meets Manon Lescaut, this beautiful young girl, and he elopes with her. And from then on, it's just, uh, it's just sin after sin after sin. Um, I don't want to tell you exactly what's going on, but, uh, uh, the idea is that even though they eloped in order to get married, they don't. They just live side by side together. Uh, not side by side, they live together. And um, then they run out of money. So how do they get money? Well, in a way that is not very honest. Um, I don't know if it was legal at the time. Probably not quite legal either. And not very honest and not very moral. And um, anyway, things happen that make our young men not innocent and pure anymore. So I wonder if he, if he will realize what he's becoming or not, or yeah. And I wonder if he will take some part of the blame or if he just will blame it all on Manon. Um, yeah, so we'll see. So I, I'm, I'm keeping reading this. I will probably finish it quite soon, I guess, because I have uh, under 100 pages left to read. I am also reading Secondhand Time. I am at about page 200. Um, it's unlikely that I will finish it before the end of November. I'm reading about 50 pages a day, not quite. Uh, so that would uh, take me to about uh, December 2 or 3. So um, I'm reading it slowly. I don't have necessarily a, a end date. There's no deadline for it. So I I'm keeping reading it. And I really like, um, I really like the way uh, Alexievich is writing. Uh, the way she tells stories is that uh, she interviewed a bunch of people and then she uses all these testimonies and turns it into a uh, mosaic of what is going on, of the situation. In this particular book, it is the fall of the Soviet Union that she's talking about. And um, yeah, I, I really like these uh, multiple point of view history books. Um, it's the fourth book that I'm reading by Alexievich, so I know what to expect, uh, but uh, so far I'm liking it very much. A um, couple more things. Um, I'll start with the sad thing first. Um, today in um, Steve Donoghue's tag, he did uh, the end of the year book tag and he talked about uh, some books that he was uh, that he was going to read before the end of the year and one of them is about Orador sur Glan. Now of course this is not the book that Steve Donoghue is talking about. Uh, this is the book that I bought there, that I bought in Orador sur Glan. Um, 
I'm trying to avoid the glare here, okay, like this. Uh, Oradour sur Glan, it's a village in France near Limoges, and during World War II, uh, the Nazis, the SS, just uh, surrounded the village, gathered everyone on the fairground in the middle of the village, separated the men and children, from, uh, the women and children from the men. They brought the men in barns, they brought the women and children in the church, they made them wait, they shot the men and burned the barns. They set bombs in the church that exploded and set fire to the church. Of all the people who were present in the village that day, six survived. Five men survived the barns, one woman survived the church, and that is it. Everyone else died. 642 people dead. And um, yeah, I just wanted to, to show you to, um, it's um, it's extremely moving. Uh, the village was preserved. It was um, uh, Charles de Gaulle who decided that the village would be preserved. And in this book, we have um, it's a booklet. We have plans of uh, where the people were hiding and uh, well, yeah, hiding in a way how they escaped, and there are images of what was left. Uh, and I visited the place uh, when I went to Europe a few years ago. Here's a picture of the church before and after. Yeah, my fingers are on there, yeah. So before and after. And um, yeah, it, it's, a, it's a very moving place. Uh, it, it's one of these places that uh, sometimes I wonder, why am I visiting this? Is so many people suffered here. Why do I want to see this? Um, but at the same time, I think it's important that we visit these places, that we see them, so that we know that these horrible things did happen and that we not forget. Because if we forget, we could easily do it again. And every time there's some sort of massacre, we keep thinking, okay, it's the last time, it's the last time, we'll never let this happen again. Uh, and that's what we thought with World War II. Okay, it's the last time there will never be another genocide. But then there was Serbia and then there was um, Rwanda. And now in China, do, are we doing anything for the uh, Uyghurs? Um, so, um, yeah, it's, it's a very moving thing. So um, I, I will keep an eye out for that book about Orador Soplan uh, in English. Um, I haven't read anything any complete book about it. This is what I've read and I've seen a few documentaries and there are quite a few of them on, on YouTube, uh, particularly if you speak French, there are tons of them, um, but there are also a few ones in English. So you, you may want to check that. Uh, maybe I'll leave links in the description box. I'll try to find a few and I'll leave links to them if you're interested. And uh, on a happier note though, um, not much less crazy, well, much less crazy, uh, <laughs> on a happier note, there's a challenge going around on booktube the 100 books challenge uh, so far i've seen one two three four people accepted the challenge or adopt the challenge or pledge to the challenge and the challenge is that you pledge to read 100 of your own books before you buy any other book i won't do it I will not, I won't even try. <laughs> I put myself on a book diet and as you saw at the beginning of this vlog, I caved in. I, I, I was not supposed to buy books, but I did buy books anyway. Um, according to my diet, I'm allowed to buy one book for every three of my own books that I read. And before I went book shopping on Sunday, I had one credit. I had read three of my own books. I was allowed to buy one and I bought four. And I'm being generous when I say four because that box set, there were five books in there, but three of them I had already read. So I'm not counting them as to be read because I know the content of these books. But I nevertheless got back with four books when I was allowed only one. So that would mean that to get back even on my uh, TBR diet, I should read nine books of my own and still not be allowed to buy any more books. And then after reading nine of my own books, I would go back on a three for one diet. And uh, yeah, so, so all of that to say that 100 books without that, forcing myself to read 100 books without getting any is, is to set myself up for failure.
So I'm not going to take the challenge, but I do wish good luck to the people who are crazy enough to try for that challenge. <laughs> that is it for now. Next clip. Hello, we are a couple of days later. I have now finished Manon Lescaut. It was not quite the morality tale I was expecting, which is not a bad thing, uh, because in morality tales, good things happen to good people and bad things happen to bad people. And generally, the bad people realize they did bad things and then they try to go for redemption. It's not quite what happens here. So it's a, it's a good story. Um, however, <laughs> I don't like the narrator. Um, well, I like it while I read it, but I, I'm very glad I don't know anyone like this because I'm sure the narrator is convinced he did absolutely nothing wrong and that he's just an innocent party in all of this and that it was just natural that given he loved Manon so much that he did all of everything that he did. He's a psychopath. <laughs> he lies to his friends. He manipulates people. He commits crimes all in the name of love. He's a bad person, so um, I don't like him. But I did like the story very much. It was, uh, it was very good. I really enjoyed this book. So if you like classics of French literature, this is a good one. And then uh, I have started another book. I've got this from the library. Mussolini also did a lot of good. The Spread of Historical Amnesia. It was written by Francesco Filippi and translated from the Italian by John Irving. <laughs> the name is written on the back. Uh, so as the title says, or pretty much says, uh, the, the author is a historian and he wants to debunk the myths that are now spreading about Mussolini, about how he was not all that bad and how he did a lot of good things. And he goes at them one by one and decides that uh, it's time to set the facts straight. And in the introduction, he says that uh, in, uh, in these days of fake news, it's very hard to keep up with contemporary fake news. But however, with the revision of history, it's still possible to set the, the, the record straight and uh, to make sure the facts are clear. And he explains there that the reason for doing that is that the basis for a possible totalitarian future depends partly on the rehabilitation of the totalitarian past. So it is true that if we look at the past and past dictators thinking, well, they were not so bad, people were happy back then, then it's much easier for a dictator to impose himself in current days because people will have some sort of skewed vision of what dictatorship really was. And I think it's very important because my other read, Secondhand Time, uh, in this, Svetlana Alexievich talks about uh, the fall of communism and life under communism. And quite a few people in there are remembering the Stalin days almost with rosy rose glasses, uh, pink glasses. They, they see life as like it was beautiful. Stalin took care of us. Oh, the murders, they were not so bad. The deported people, yeah, well. And they basically have selective memory, though not all of them. Many of them, uh, of the people interviewed, say Stalin was bad. But uh, many people in there, particularly the people interviewed in the 1990s, long for the days when Russia was led by an iron fist. Um, in the 1990s, Russia was pure chaos. People got killed for absolutely no reason. People got suddenly poor. Uh, there was nothing in the stores. Capitalism was not what it was expected to be. And um, a lot of people did not like the, the Russia of the 1990s. So they started, for some of them, to long for the days of authoritarian rule. And that leads me to another book that's on my TBR, Putin's People. Uh, because nowadays Russia is a dictatorship, uh, whether they like it or not, whether they realize it or not. Uh, Putin is there to stay until he's going to die. So, or until he, yeah, no, until he's going to die. I was about to say until he's murdered, but if he's murdered, he dies. So <laughs> he's going to, the, to stay at the head of Russia until he dies. And um, yeah, so, so, so that, uh, that makes a good point for uh, this book about Mussolini. I think uh, the author is right in uh, saying that uh, we have to set the facts straight for the past because it's a barrier against future excesses, let's say that. So that is where I am. I think I'm going to end my vlog here because otherwise it's going to be too long. And um, yeah, I have uh, quite a few books. I, I doubt I will finish them anyway, the, the two books I have started. 
Um, this one is quite short. It's under 200 pages, but this one I still have uh, almost 500 pages left to read. So um, that it's doubtful that I will finish reading them before the weekend. So I'm just going to end my vlog here. And uh, thank you everyone for watching. I don't know what my next video will be, what sort of shape it will be, uh, but I'll see you soon. Thank you for watching. À la prochaine.